Remember in the morning when the sun rises, she's always yellow. And we actually have yellow people on Earth. In our language, we call the climate the qi of nature. So qi is the fundamental energy matrix that connect both the human body, the plant, the animal, and the earth. Then in the south, when sun shines highest, the one that sees always white. Now we realize there are actually white people on this earth. Let's do everything we know how to do to participate in the healing of the planet. That's why we're here. And in the west where the sun sets, she's always red. Now we know that there are red people. The indigenous wisdom that I was learning from my elders about how we're all, there's only one hoop of life. The hoop of life only knows we, not me. And at night it's always black. Now we have black people. The butterfly cannot force the caterpillar into a butterfly. It is a process he has to go within its, in of itself. And as you have noticed in your life, there are many levels and layers of realities within every one of us. It's to become aware of them, which will make a difference. Four races on earth living. We're going to have to learn to live together. We're going to have to learn to live with each other's belief system and being in balance and joy of one another. That's number one. That's new culture. We know the population is going to go to at least 10 billion. So the challenge is, by the middle of this century, can we live as 10 billion people together in peace and avoid environmental catastrophe? When we go deeper into this conversation is that, of course, it sits on a lake of trauma. My father was murdered when I was 13, and it was race-related. He was mistaken for someone else during the racial tension of the 60s. Of a white man and a black man had a fight. The white man returned to the bar my dad was having a beer after work and just saw his profile and thought he was the black man and killed him on a lake of unacknowledged oppression, of power over, of exploitation. It sits on a deep layer of fractured relationship. The insanity of taking a life, of not understanding our connection to each other, the traumatic past of inflicting cruelty upon each other, which lies at the heart, the root of climate change. You know, when we see somebody as an irredeemable enemy, then our options are limited. The only option is to overcome them by some kind of force, or maybe to bypass them, to lock them out, or something like that. But when we understand that this person is as I would be, if I were in those circumstances, then new options become available, the option of changing the circumstances. So rather than pointing at somebody else, I'm reminded that three fingers are pointing back at myself. So understand what's happening internally here so that I can, op I can respond, I can be in powerful action, but do it in out of a conscious way. It's not either or, it's both and, and that we have to learn how to grow to hold that inside of ourselves and with each other. The people that we see doing things that hurt, right? Everyone's focused on Donald Trump and Monsanto. So you could focus on those characters and say, well, um, that desire to, 
being drunk on power or in a bad, in a false way, you know, in a way that's unhealthy. And I think they're addicted to that power. So I can look inside myself and say, where, where is that in my psyche? And bring some healing there. And actually, I believe that does have an impact to the collective field. The inner climate is much of a science as the outer climate. It's both an art and a science. So where is the fossil fuel mind in my own thought patterns? And where can I just let that dissolve so that the organic mind can rise again? How can I open my heart wide enough and be courageous enough and awake enough to be the hands and the ears and the eyes and the voice of the earth and of life. And I don't think I need an answer that's known by the mind, but I need to remember to keep asking the question and follow where it leads. It was about, um, about 15 years ago. I was traveling back to Tibet. Um, and it was along, a, and I, I saw this um, river, Yangtze River, um, <clears throat> which is in Chinese culture, we call the mother, mother river that has nurtured us with her milk. Mm. And it was heartbreaking for me to see all the dams. All over the world, dams are being built on, on rivers that are disrupting the hydrological cycle, that are flooding some places and draining other places of their water. Across Africa, across the Sahel, this is happening. The inner Niger Delta, which is an area the size of Belgium, full of hippopotamuses and crocodiles and, and just teeming with life. It will be totally destroyed by this, I can't remember the name of this gigantic new dam that is gonna produce carbon neutral energy. Now, if we really measured everything, if we were able to measure the entire contribution of all of those ecosystems that are gonna die, then maybe it wouldn't actually be carbon neutral after all. I remember when I was five, I lived in a very suburban um, neighborhood and I remember sitting on the grass on the front lawn and looking around and saying, oh, imagine if the concrete street was just a forest and in between all these houses we had forest. Um, so there was a wanting everything to be more natural. And according to the UN, the destruction and degradation of land is the single biggest reason for refugees. And they're saying, if we do not change the way we relate to the land, we are going to have an unmanageable problem of people being forced to move. They're displaced people. The refugee problem is a problem of displacement. People who are needing to flee or move because of tsunamis or because of intense weather conditions or because their islands in the Pacific are disappearing. I feel like the plight of people who are already suffering moves me a lot. Then when I was 13, I learned they were cutting down the Amazon forest and I was totally devastated by that news. The lungs of Mother Earth, I've been to only one of them in Am Amazonia. That's the lung, one of the lungs of Mother Earth. We're cutting the trees. So we're disabling Mother Earth to breathe properly, so we can breathe as human beings, as animals, and the plants, and the minerals. You know, even walking on the beach where I grew up and now seeing all the plastic and styrofoam that's covering it, it breaks my heart. <laughs> it breaks my heart every day. Just a few weeks ago, a beautiful whale washed up in the Philippines. She suffocated from the plastic she's eaten. 50 kilo of it. That means we have polluted the ocean, the way we behave, 
only way we live. A healthy climate depends on a healthy body, you know, healthy organs. And healthy organs can handle fluctuations in greenhouse gases. But if we destroy the living organs of a living being, then the planet becomes very sensitive. And our whole mind was shifted to a mechanical paradigm, to a mechanical way of viewing the world, and a mechanical way that had to get rid of a consciousness. My world appeared quite successful and quite normal and um, but meanwhile within I had this growing sense of dissatisfaction and something is amiss and um, and at that stage having not known anything about spirituality yet made me seem if I'm even imagining it or going crazy because I've got no reason to be dissatisfied or unhappy in any way. You know got married, had kids, was a breadwinner kept taking care of other people and never taking care of myself, really. And at the same time being very frustrated about that and just going on like this for years, um, being happy as well as some of the time, but, you know, just running myself down, really, literally. We are caught up in these superficial things uh, that give us identity or val value us according to some matrix. So we, we turned our identity to those things, um, materials, titles, status. We are not meant to be cogs in an industrial and money machine. We have a deeper meaning. We are not cogs in a machine. But for the very young people who are in this room, they get it. And I always related my process that I went through through that of a butterfly going from the caterpillar to the cocoon and melting in transformation and then re-emerging as this butterfly. And once I stopped and I went to lie down, my body said, this is what I've been telling you for years that you need to do. You're going to be crazy if you think I'm going to let you move again anytime soon. So I, by then I had some quite severe neurological damage for about 11 months after that. I could hardly talk. I went from speaking four languages every day to not being able to have a conversation in even one of them. Caterpillars are quite um, destructive in a sense. You know, ask any vegetable grower, they would say, like, you'd come there, they would just chomp, chomp, chomp through everything and you could see they've left a mess or their mark and they, they basically decimated your crops, your cabbages, whatever. When I was growing up, 4% of India had cars. We still have 4% or a little more that has cars. But the, my landlord in Delhi has five cars. Instead of being so focused and in the caterpillar world and what the caterpillars are doing is to celebrate my new wings. I experience this as what you might call embodied awakening. And that's not about the degree of awakening or anything, but, but it's about the consciousness aspect being integral to how life can be different from what we're doing now. So reclaiming our consciousness is also reclaiming the potential of our creativity, reclaiming the potential of us being partners with the earth, not her masters. And as co-creators and co-producers, we can address every big problem of our times. Climate change is one symptom. We name the crisis the climate crisis right now, but it comes from something much deeper, and it will not be over if we succeed in reducing greenhouse gases. That's not the core of the crisis. We need to hold space for the cultural shift that is not going to just be transitioning energy, but the mentality of mankind. Because so much of how we live and operate in the world is broken, further than just the light bulbs we use and the place we get our energy from. So much of how we are treating the earth, so much of the ideology that our generation was, grew, grew up learning 
that we can take whatever we want whenever we want from the earth without thinking about giving back like these mentalities the old ways of thinking that have gotten us into where we are currently with the earth what have we done wrong we forgot to do the ceremony to celebrate life instead we raped the earth so we caused the climate change. It started off with the two young men observing that water was coming out in the month of January from the wall of a big ice. That's 1963. In 1978, in August, I gave a talk in the United Nations mm. on environmental conference, and I told him about, about that the big ice is melting. I got a standing ovation. I was just, uh, so I was very proud to standing ovation. So I ran home to Greenland, and I, my mom and dad invited all these beautiful, beautiful elders. My father. Stop me in mid sentence as I'm telling the elders, and he said, "Did he hear you?" And I, I, I looked at my father. I said, "They gave me a standing ovation, ten, fifteen minutes long." And then I carried on telling the story, and at the end he stopped me again, and looked at me and said, "But did he hear you?" I realized he wanted to know if my message came across to these people. Now I know that it didn't. Before Copenhagen, there was an orchestrated denial that the glaciers are melting. We were doing a report on the third pole. In the beginning of the report, the environment minister was saying, yeah, the glaciers are melting. By the end of it, the message has come deny. And suddenly they were growing. <laughs> now I have spoken in 71 countries about climate change. I traveled a long way to be with you. I wanted to tell you it's too late now. It's too late. In 1995 or so, when the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change put out its first big report, it was very clear to the world scientists precisely what was going on. We'd won the argument, but we were losing the fight because the fight was not about data and reason. The fight was what fights are usually about, money and power. You cannot reverse your clock. You cannot. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you are a scientist, an expert, academic, or someone knowledgeable. It does not matter. I don't care. It's too late. You did not change. It is literally business as usual that is doing us in. It's just all of us getting up every day and doing the same things we did the day before and continuing down the same path. You, we, I depended on you that you heard the message. I depended on you that you heard the message. Now IPCC is saying 12 years from now, if we don't change, it'll be inevitable to collapse. And it is your fault. And it is your fault. And it is your fault. Porque com as contaminações que vocês estão jogando, because with the pollution that you're doing, tem destruído as nossas vidas. It has been destroying our lives. Então isso é uma responsabilidade de todos nós. So this is a responsibility from all of us. Nós não estamos aqui para encontrar um culpado. No, we are not here to find a guilty apontar, person. Apontar a culpa de ninguém. Or to point out uh, guilt. Para julgar ninguém. To judge anyone. Mas nós estamos aqui para assumir compromissos. But we are here to assume commitment. Why did you not listen to the indigenous world who told you over and over and over and over that you need to do something different? Why didn't you do that? The failure of our civilization should teach us that we actually don't know. It should bring us to a point of humility.
The strongest feeling that I have around that is grief for my children. And um, having the feeling that I have let them down because I wasn't focused enough before it became so clear for me that we should have focused a long time ago. It's not to turn our back on pain and sadness and grief, particularly the phenomenon of anticipatory grief, as we think what our world will look like for our children, 2020, 2030, 2040, 2050. And for them as well, I want to pour every love that I have into yeah, doing my part in, in creating a more beautiful world. I just needed to come up and say this because it's just burning inside of me that I respect every single person in this room. But right now I feel like it's the youth's time. <laughs> I want you to panic because as someone who has had their house burned down around them, it is, it is terrifying and horrible to be in that situation. The ones who have come here, we're, we're hopeful. We decided to do something, but there's a lot of us around the world who are not hopeful. There's a lot of good reasons that we're not hopeful. None of them cared. None of them were like, there was a couple people, but it, it was just such a level of like, oh yeah, well, it's gonna die anyway, so I might as well just, you know, do drugs and alcohol and enjoy it while it lasts kind of thing. And it was just like, it hurt so much. And they look at their parents who are just burning petrol and just burning and f doing fossil fuels and oil and gas and it's just painful to watch them enter a life. You know, they're following their parents' footsteps. Everyone's perfectly aware that it's coming, um, that climate change is an issue, but um, no one really cares about it. Um, none of the adults in my life care about it. We drive a big SUV. Please just listen to what we're saying. Don't just have us talk just to say, oh yeah, I talk to youth. I just listen to them, you know? They've given me so much hope. We're, we're a lot more than that. We're looking at this from an entirely different perspective, saying, what can we do differently? We don't need to debate about what's important. We already know. Like, it's, we can't, you know, spend millions of dollars lobbying anymore. We don't have time for that. I guess what I'm asking is if anyone has an, an experience of being a leader, doing what's hard, going against the flow because they care, and what gives them the strength to do that? We need you to be hopeful so we can grow up with an example of someone who's hopeful. Hope is critical to our work, whether that is inner work or outer work, it's still critical. To keep hope alive, which I feel like a lot of hopelessness is occurring, and that's I think really people have forgotten how to dream, because dreams allow you to go beyond the facts. There's the facts against this, facts against that. No, dreams allow you to see further, the possibility. And then when, once we put those in us, those dreams in our spirit, it pulls us towards that. So it turns us toward that positive action. But if you want to be hopeful in this world, you've got to work for it all the time, because if we're not working flat out to do what needs to be done over the next 10, 15, 20 years, whatever it is, then, sorry to put this bluntly, nobody's entitled to hope at all. Because unless we're that committed, doing that kind of work, inside ourselves and outside, then the prospects are not good. The part that says hope is necessary, hope is important, hope is what young people are asking for from us, and then a part that feels hopeless. Both, I dance with both.
So that's what I've been dedicating my life and my work to, is to build a science of the inner climate, to study the carbon, the water cycle, the soil, and the energy of our inner uh, environmental system. When you ask where is the deforestation inside of me, I think that is the part of me that in the past allowed myself to, conf to feel like I had to conform to what society expected of me. You know, put on makeup, look fake, look plastic. If I'm picking at the skin on my fingers, which is something that I do when I get overly agitated, I know that I have a mind that can be critical and that can pick at myself or at other people. So I, 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 and then I do my best to catch myself and either go, all right, my fingers need some kindness here, or my fingers have something that they want to express because there's energy in there that's needing to move. We know the grief, we know the tragedies, we know the hope in our bodies. And it is through our bodies that we expand into the resilience that is given to us and that is being kindled by this urgency that we have created. So our bodies are both the vehicles of the loss and the vehicles of the transformation. So that's the, that's the breakthrough. It gave me the freedom. And it, it gave me a perspective to make peace with the past and the trauma. What happened after this physical breakdown, let's say, um, was that I faced spirituality and I said, well, show me what you got. And I really went into the spiritual connection with the earth in a whole lot of different ways. And I reached a point where all I experienced was just this huge big wave of one love of everything, uh, which I, I surfed for like four or five months, just that oneness sensation. The blessing of the trauma is that when the unifying experience occurs within the human body, because it's holistic, it's not just something you experience in your heart or you just experience in your brain. I experience it, and I think everyone experiences throughout the cellular matrix of the unified field of the human body. During that time, I couldn't even remember what it felt like to feel fear or pain or anger. And I couldn't imagine ever feeling anything like that again. It was quite mind-blowing. It was completely different from my life before. And that has remained really important for navigating the love of the earth and the pain of, of what goes on. When that happens, when I feel connected, because I'm coming from such enormous disconnection, it is absolutely a moment or sometimes a longer period of exaltation. And that is when I am not only aware of the unified field, I am the unified field. I had to learn to love myself first. If I don't love myself, it's impossible to love other people. So I had to go back to myself and say, holy shoot, I really had to learn to love myself. I uh, started a journey for three years just being with myself because I realized that a lot of people are searching for love, and I was doing that for myself, looking outside of myself, putting myself in situations, and realizing that really I needed to love myself. And because of my weakness, I take on what people say, and then I react on them, and I had to stop reacting on them. I had to look, look at myself, how am I? 
that is my inner work every day and it's not easy because you have to be very stable, very balanced to know what is your fear, what is your intuition. To check in with myself, how am I feeling? Um, and it's not like I always want to keep myself feel good. It's not like that, like that at all. I think that's also a big aware, awareness or change in me. Maybe 20 years ago I would have thought, oh, I feel grief, now I should unload it all so I don't feel it anymore. I don't feel that's my practice now. It's that I feel grief, feel it. It's like there's a weather forecast, weather monitoring station <laughs> that's keep a record of how I'm feeling. How do I feel it in my body? Where do I feel it? I feel it in my stomach, do I feel it in my heart, do I feel it in my throat, my shoulders. Where do I feel it? And just uh, acknowledge it and say, ah, oh, welcome, grief, welcome, anger, welcome, sadness, welcome, joy, welcome, hope, welcome, movement. It's not easy, it's not comfortable, but it's also a relief to make space for those feelings and to, and to allow them to have a home inside of me is also a relief because in my experience when those feelings have a home in me then they're not actually as scary and then I get to um, well sometimes in, enjoy them even as as richness as fuel as um, deliciousness might be taking it a little bit too far it depends I have had times in the last few years where I've experienced my rage and gone wow that was so cool <laughs> you know of like oh finally finally I get to have that energy be alive inside of me and feel its potency as something useful and that is actually incredibly satisfying and it isn't destructive so this kind of visceral movement of feeling through me I would say is the most effective way for me to deal with the churning that happens when I see what's happening to my planet my home my home our home One practice that I've been, that I've adopted recently is to maintain an altar and touch in with it every day as a way to, to be anchored to a different reality. In my silence in the meditations, I consciously connect up to um, wisdom that goes beyond my small personality and my small brain intelligence. I call on it and I find that I am supported. I'm not so focused on finding out what that intelligence is that goes beyond my intelligence. I'm more focused on connecting to it. And I find that whenever I do that and I go beyond my personality and mind intelligence, I have insights that surprise me. I received climate change and consciousness in complete guidance. Every component of it was delivered in about 15 minutes, maybe less. So I meditate an hour a day, at least, and I often wake up at night and I meditate more. But that helps me um, notice where I have contracted. It helps me to digest what is happening during the day I love being alone in the land. The moment I have a chance, I'll be in my tent and just stay there. I will take walks, I will chant, and I will remember people I need to remember. And then the animal world comes to me, and it is so stunningly beautiful. I talk to the animals like I'm talking to you. And it's so interesting, the intellect and capacity for animals to listen to you. And they talk back. I received an amazing message from the blackbird. And it was sitting up in a tree above my head and singing its heart out in the most beautiful song. And I thought, my goodness, he's singing from pure love. And that's what we all need. And he gave me this message. 
Sing your heart out like me, for it can open the hearts of others and heal them. Never hide your gift, but give it as a gift to others. When you listen and absorb all around you, you are never alone, for you feel the oneness, the connection to all that is. Everyone knows that you, you turn on the cell phone, you can call, and as long as you have the number, you can call any other cell phone. So the premises of um, this kind of you know psychic communication is the similar principle of nervous system is by nature connected through the wavelengths of the energy of other nervous system. So as long as you got the right number, you can dial to any other being. There was a very famous physicist of India called J.C. Bose. He was a physicist. You know, what he'd do is he'd do electromagnetic experiments with plants. And he said, but they're living. Because when you say nasty things, the electromagnetic waves show it. They get hurt. They're sentient beings. Big debate. And you can smell that incredible blossom of all these beautiful plants who say thank you to the Great One, showing us their diversity how different they are from each other but how stunningly beautiful they are together and that the consciousness of the humans need to learn here in this world the mountain and the river i felt it always talk it was always talking to me but uh, because China has imported scientific materialism at the time I was born, mm. there's, no, um, there's no way for me to make sense that experience. There's no way for me to talk about it. Today it's very strange for some people when people talk to the mountains. The Big Father today in the morning was saying they were talking to the ice, so then you talk to the trees. When you harvest, you just don't go and grab. You speak to the tree, get permission to take from the berries, but knowing not all must be harvested. The birds must get something, the other, um, maybe the lizards must get something, and then you lift over some. So you would not harvest everything, and you'd also bow down and give thanks when you harvest. So that was how it was done. Plants are sentient, we've got to give them respect. Animals are sentient, we've got to give them respect. But not only is all life sentient, but all life is interconnected and partnership in a non-violent production system is the only way to get out of the fossil fuel age and the climate trap. Other beings can be our allies, not because they're gonna help us win against the military industrial complex, but because we're tapping into another world of cause and effect. There's some other things at work that I do not know from my senses. Um, maybe not even know for intuition, but trusting that great mystery, that there are other beings and things that are a part of what's going on. It's not just, you know, at this point and this point, there's so much. As some of the indigenous elders have set the information that we need for the adequate responses are there. They're in the air, they're in the information that floods around us. We just need to start trusting and listening. On the climate side, it's about being energy clever, traveling lighter, wasting less, and eating healthier. None of them are bad for us. It's all good. It's, it's all for the good. We have the technologies, we have the finance, it's on the wrong side of the river, but we have it. Uh, we, have the, we know what the policies are. We know, you know what we need to do. We have to actually be able to change our mindset. This is all about our mindset. 100% renewable electricity all over the world by 2030 
us by 2030 is completely doable. Ain't going to be nuclear, ain't going to be gas, ain't going to be oil, it's going to be renewables. It's for certain. There's no doubt about it now. And it's not just the price of the renewables, it's the price of the storage. It's the capability of the distribution system, these new HVDC wires so you can ship power over long distance. We know that two things are true. Number one, the path toward 1.5 is the only path that we can take if we want to be true to our moral compass. And we particularly have the challenge to actually give up the material consumption but maintain our real wealth. Going from extractive to circular systems, from the globalized greed economy to local economies. Number two, the path to 1.5 is the only path that we can take if we want to increase economic stability and in fact profitability and economic growth. Ecology is the science of the earth, economy is the management of the earth. The management of the earth was forgotten, money making became the way to go. We cannot choose between the two, we have to follow the same path for the two objectives. Again, two realities that sometimes people pit against each other. And they are not two realities that to be pitted, they're actually two realities to be brought into convergence. Protect any ecosystem that is still intact. I need to speak to underline the importance of protecting the primary forest and any intact forest landscape that we have remaining. Without these primal ecosystems, Amazon, Congo, the remaining mangroves of Southeast Asia, etc. There's, there's more, but without these, there will be no hope for a living planet. When you actually give nature a chance to return, it will in strength. And that's important because that protecting biodiversity by restoring nature is also one of the big solutions of storing, uh, of protecting climate. We live in Raglan in New Zealand. There's a beautiful harbour that was completely silted up and there was dead and no fish and no life. And some volunteers just started fencing off the waterways and planting riparian margins, just a small group. The, the life of the harbour is transformed and now the harbour sees life again. And the, the seagrass has come back like wildfire in the last two years, and the fish are back in the harbour. Just shifting the way you eat, eating well, eating with a small ecological footprint, eating fresh, eating organic, can be the biggest contribution to addressing climate change. Leave behind the stuff that the caterpillars are eating. Leave behind factory farmed animals leave behind food that has been grown in a way that is destroying the earth, that has been grown with pesticide, that is coming from a faceless place. Through a changed food and agriculture system that doesn't contribute to greenhouse gases, we can address climate instability. The scientific evidence is there, and it can begin with your eating. Now, the climate crisis is, is the umbrella that is touching and connecting everything we care about, whether that's biodiversity or oceans, or forestation, or animal rights, or gender equality, or racial equality, or global relations and peace, like anything that you care about, climate change is the umbrella that is gonna determine and put strain on any issue that we are thinking about. Climate change is the defining issue of our time. I have learned in my life if it's change, then you have to be the change you want to see. Then you don't look at the powerful who've brought us into this devastation and say, please, mister, will you stop the destruction and bring change? We've got to make them redundant to the future. Young people rise and teach these old people like me how to take care of the earth. I've had a lot of conversations about when is something activism and when isn't it. Sp specifically with the environment of when I was in Calais in the refugee camp in the jungle. 
and probably 90% of the young people working, volunteering in the camp. If you called them an activist, they'd get probably offended or really pissed off. Now, I'm really not interested in this, uh, in this argument and this fight about um, ideology. I think we need to move past that. I think we need to work with practical challenges that are in front of us. And, and for me, that's why the people in Calais were activists, because they weren't just fighting, they were actually doing what they thought was right and what they thought other people should do, and they were being an example for it. And do so in a way where we really trust our ability to uncover new solutions, to um, take inspiration from nature, to sit down and actually uh, appreciate our shared humanity and let that inspire something that actually we can be proud of, right? It's the difference between like, like a freedom fighter or, you know, someone who's rebelling. Yeah, I'm, I'm super not interested in acting as a reaction to what I experienced. So I think part of the path is to really look, ah, this is what's really happening. Can I really see that fully and feel it fully? And then can I create the inner conditions, the spaciousness, the, to listen deeply enough to know that this is now my step. And maybe my step is to be an artist. Maybe my step is to do a dance piece. Maybe my step is to go to the streets of London and stand and, and stick myself to a London bus. You know? But I need to know what is my calling at this moment and then to play that part fully. I have full respect for activists and I want to empower them. But I want to empower them to help them to dial to that precise aligned action so that they create, they generate inner sustainability. Very often people who feel, I've got the miracle condition. Now I'm going to hit you on the head and force you to think like me and be like me. It's violent. It is this kind of breaking of the pattern of harm, refusing to be complicit with it and saying, I'm not going to live my life like that. And that, that, that's absolutely critical here. It's not about complaining about what's happening now, it's about creating something else. And my quest, my question to myself was how do we create a law of ecocide to criminalise mass damage and destruction, to close the door to significant harm, but also to create a legal duty of care for the earth. And this is about recognising and upholding the Earth's right to life. And when I say Earth, I mean all living beings, human and non-human beings. You know, you can sort of go away and, and manifest something and, and try to forget about the mainstream, or you can interact and try to turn the mainstream that way, which is the more activist perspective. I mean, this is where something like the Extinction Rebellion really comes into play. Mm -hmm. uh, here in the UK and now internationally, where people are actually willing to actually create roadblocks and the like to draw attention to the fact that the government is failing in its responsibility to protect humanity against possibly the world's largest ever crisis. Extinction Rebellion is important. It's basically saying we will shape our ways. Well, I think we should respond now with the public movement, adults joining with younger people in a similar sort of strike as a way of expanding that out, as a way of echoing it and making it louder and bigger. And we need to do it because we need to change everything quickly. And it'll take that scale of, of a complete revolution. It's a revolution for evolution. It's an evolutionary leap, but, and it's peaceful. I think that's why Extinction Rebellion's worked, because what they're singing there is all you need is love. It doesn't matter if Extinction Rebellion disappears at the end of this year. It'll come again. That's the point of the genie being out of the bottle. There is no going back now, literally no going back on the presence of truth in our lives. Choosing to actually uh, live in the way I want to see the world remaining flourishing rather than saying oh i wish it was like that but sadly i'm not living it because if i'm not living it then i'm not contributing to it in fact if anything i'm complicit in its demise
We have something sad to share tonight, but it's also at this special time on Easter where death and life are so close together. So, Polly Higgins left much faster than we expected. She was going to be here at the conference. Yeah, so we want to just stay with you in this. And Robin will read a message and we'll have a silence together. All of you, dear ones, Polly's gone. Just half an hour ago, peacefully with her husband beside her, and Anita and Zambodi, and on Easter, the festival of new life in more than one tradition. Extinction Rebellion in London are going to make an announcement at 6 p.m. tonight and seize the moment to let the whole rebellion know about her and Greta, who will be there too, and to say that she is now passing the baton to all of us. It's up to all of us now. So much love. She'll be there. She'll be everywhere. Polly stood in a place that has no name. That place that I call the gap. The gap that is um, the split in, in human consciousness where denial and manipulation and cruelty and power over and the condoned death of people and planet sit. That place that is just so friggin painful to acknowledge in ourselves. I've never known anybody for whom the word indomitable was more appropriate. Honestly, you just couldn't believe it. In the early discussions about the work she was doing with Ecoside, you'd say, wait a minute, these are the different stages you've got to go through. That's nearly impossible, that's impossible, that's impossible. And she'd sort of say, yeah, yeah, but we can do this, we can do that, we can do the other. Literally every stage. So that courage, that indomitability took her through that. And then the other thing, and I do hope a lot of people will remember this, boy, did she know how to have good fun. And um, maybe this is a bit irreverent the day after she died, but uh, she loved good whiskey. And that's pretty special. I knew Polly, and we worked very closely on issues of ecocide, on working towards recognizing the crimes against nature. And it's the crimes against nature that are giving us climate change, that are giving us species extinction, that are giving us the pollution and disappearance of our water, the destruction of our land, the toxics everywhere and the death of our bees and butterflies. That is the killing of the earth. And Polly's work of having this declared legally as a crime, and a, a, a crime against nature, is a work I'm committed to continue. We'll remember Polly with love. And I come from a tradition where we know this body passes, but the spirit carries on and Polly's spirit will carry on. I want to invite us to like put our hands out, we'll put our hands up and say, yes, I'll take it. You know, will you take the baton of truth talking? Will you take the baton of standing? No matter how frightened you are, will you take the baton of Maintaining your sense of humor and your wild ridiculousness, your profound love of nature, and when you say yes, I will step up in any way that life asks me to. I will, I will take on Polly's mantle and let her life continue to live on through all of us and through her work. I am 
going to pollinate for Polly in every way I can. I will stand in the gap, whatever that means for me, and I know that that means that I am going to do my own healing work. I'm going to heal the inner patriarchy in me rather than projecting it out there. I commit to doing work on myself, to educating myself, to having difficult conversations that mean that I can go and ask the questions that need to be asked. I, I, when I go home now, I'm my awareness, I'm going to be very conscious about how I can uh, train my farmers to be conscious of climate change. How can we contribute in our own little way? We are to reduce the CO2 emission rather than we wait for Paris meeting. I feel a renewed commitment to fulfilling the responsibility that my generation has for what we've created. To me, the most underutilized resource we have on this planet is our good intentions as citizens, our willingness to make a difference, and our capacity to make a difference. When I go home, I'm going to go and talk to the city council. I'm going to take the open mic time and talk to the city council about everything I heard here. And I'm going to make an appointment with the mayor of my city. And if I don't get one, I'm going to sit on the steps of City Hall with my activist friends. And we're going to sit there until they give us a meeting because we have to stand up. We need to bring it back home. Like it's a planetary emergency, but we won't address it unless it's relevant for every single person. This week I had the privilege of being engaged in a very raw conversation with someone who I hold a very diametrically opposing view. And at the end of the conversation, we still disagree with each other, but we love each other more. And my commitment is, how can I bring this energy of, I disagree with you, but I love you, into the world? If you want to invite somebody to be part of the solution, it's not necessarily important that you educate them on climate science. It's not even important that they believe in climate change. What's important is that they take a step in their lives toward being in service to life. To being living people, autonomous, sovereign people in a living, beautiful planet. That identity of Earth citizens is the first thing. And that can happen in a second because it's about a paradigm shift. And we can do it today. A mí no me preocupas las gentes desarmonizantes del planeta que gritan. What doesn't worry me is the yelling of the inharmonious people on the planet. Lo que yo busco es... What I'm looking for is... El grito de las personas buenas del planeta con esos vamos lograr para todo. The loud voices of the good people on this planet who will stand up and say, we are going to accomplish this. Destruindo a natureza, achando que a sabedoria e destruindo.
To me, still, it feels a bit like, oh yeah, we hear the youth and the indigenous people, and then we move on to business as usual. So how can we create a big, inviting, warm, respectful, listening space to really hear what they are saying and apply that? Everyone matters. And so whatever is yours to do, whether it's really small or it's huge, do it. Do it with others, do it with heart-centered, because life itself is calling us. I said, all you shareholders and all you stakeholders, we've got to break the spell of the multinational because we breathe the same air. Oh, it's everywhere. Oh, yes, we breathe. before us who oh, they breathe it too Hitler and a Jesus and the Buddha too oh we breathe the same air oh yes we breathe the same air you shared a breath with a lion you shared a breath with a worm You shared a breath with everything that there is So, Mama, please tell me And, Papa, please tell me Why we find it so hard To share just about everything else Let's make it easy to share just like a breathing the air Let's make it easy to share Just like a breathing 